How's it, everyone? Welcome to episode four of Words Words Speak. Um, okay, I'm a Cape Town guy, born and bred, but um, I'm seriously considering moving over to Durban. Woo, woo, woo. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> not for you. Um, oh. It's because of this beverage uh, that we drink every time we shoot a podcast. It's called the Durban Poison Cannabis Lager, brewed by Poison City Brewing. Super good, super nice and crisp. Makes you feel like summer is around the corner, which Sorry. it is actually by the time you're watching this, it'll be in the middle of December. So we can have a nice summer braai on the beach in Derbs and sink one of these guys. So definitely check them out. Um, amazing, amazing beer. Anyway, moving on to who we've got on for this episode. Uh, a girl by the name of Kaylee Marcroft. What an amazing human. So the, actually, the way that I came across Kaylee was I was looking into the 100 most influential young South Africans uh, of 2019 and she was one of them and, and i read more into her, and i was just so fascinated by her story that we decided to bring her on uh kaylee is a young lady with cerebral palsy so she's in a wheelchair and that has not stopped her from doing a lot throughout her life she's also got her own ngo called uh, the kaylee campaign which she describes as a non-profit organization working to mobilize the minds and bodies of children with disabilities basically providing them with those electric wheelchairs and because it made such a difference in her life when she received her first electric wheelchair. So yeah, throughout you're going to learn a lot about the challenges she's overcome, what it's like being in her position as well as her goals and her ambitions for the future. And I think you guys are really, really going to enjoy this episode. Awesome. Shake enjoy and Enjoy guys. <laughs> How there? How's it going? Good. How are you? <laughs> All good. Thanks for the straw. No worries. You're welcome. I feel like I'm getting drunk or faster though. Yeah. Well, you gotta practice. I think it's a, it's it's a skill. What I gotta practice about it though? I think. Because when I when I first put it in, it exploded. Yeah, you nearly you nearly died. <laughs> I think it's about it's about how you let the beer go back into the bottle so that you don't create an explosion. Okay. Oh, no, I don't want any beer going back in the bottle. Fair enough, but that's not how straws work, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can speak to the people that created that like, <laughs> yeah. bamboo, I guess. Yeah? <laughs> oh. Kaylee, firstly, thanks so much for coming on. No worries. Um, I came I'm across excited. your story when I was looking at... South Africa's 2019 list of the top 100 yes. most influential young South yeah. Africans. And I went through every single person <laughs> and your name just shot out at me. And I was like, Mark, I want her on now. Well, I'm and excited that you reached out. Yeah. I'm, and yeah, I just, we'll go a lot more into your story along the way. But I just want to say from the get-go, you are an absolute inspiration. And just from the little I've gained on you already, I'm I'm so excited to dive into what you yeah. your last story and what's what you're all about, where you're going and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. Let's do it. Cool. So how your disease is it is it is no, it a disease? Or I is do it not a... have a disease. <laughs> um I so mine is I have cerebral palsy. Yes. Which is a, a disability. Yes. Um I also have a degenerative neuropathy okay. um, what does that mean for like me but, if i was like a, a six-year-old yeah. and you had to explain so that to me. i so cerebral palsy is technically it's brain damage but yeah. it affects people differently depending on a lot of things so um mine is um i'm a spastic quadriplegic Okay. Big words, right? Yes. But basically, it means that my entire body is uncooperative yes. with my brain. Um, so it's a lot harder for me to do things than, like, if I was able-bodied. Yes. Um, my body has other plans. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I was about to say. Um, so that's that. And then my degenerative neuropathy is... Um, I was diagnosed when I was six. And uh, there's not a lot of research on neuropathy, so we were like, cool, what does that mean? Yeah. And they were like, well, we're not fully sure, and uh, it's something to do with the nerves, 
not firing or something. All over or specifically in your body? Well, I don't know. Oh, okay. See how much you pay attention we pay to yeah. these diagnoses. <laughs> No, so we kind of decided that at that point that it made no sense to worry about things getting worse or, like, yeah. degenerating because we had to focus on what I can do. And so we just focus on output now and making things, making my body do things. Who's, who's we when you're referring to we came to put I really bad at saying I like I never say I in anything team player um so we is like my squad I guess uh, like my my friends and my family and like yeah. the people that work with me and my my fitness people fit fab and all these things that's amazing but um yeah I think it's just easier to think collaboratively and to be to be a we rather than Ah, it's also a lot easier to to tackle things yes. when it's how oh, we're taking this on instead of like I'm living with my disability and it's mine yeah. and nobody else can like talk about it or claim it or because my disability is mine but my sister also experiences my disability. And it affects her in different ways to how it affects me. But she still she still lives with disability. Yeah. Um so I think we need to all think about it a lot more collectively because it affects everybody, not just the person who has the diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. How how is it growing up for you? Because as as you start <laughs> uh, as you're starting to grow up, you're starting to realize, well, actually, I'm not black, everyone else. Yeah. How was, how was that for So you? I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy when I was 11 months old. So I never, I never like did the whole walking thing by myself. I was like, yeah, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was in a wheelchair since I was like three years old. So I've always known that I had to do things differently, but it was never made to be this, like, this elephant in the room that nobody talks about. Like, it was always just, Katie has to do things a little differently. But I was never expected to not do stuff. Um, and, like, I think I've had a really lucky childhood in that my sister's older than me so she's the typical older sibling where like she tells me that I'm being lazy and like stop being bitchy yeah. when I am and people get offended on my behalf because yeah. how can she say that to a disabled person <laughs> and uh she's just like but she's my sister and she was being a bitch so <laughs> I told her. And I think no wheelchair for you today. <laughs> yeah. I think keeping it real like that is important because I'm not the most important person in the room every time. Yeah. Like maybe my needs are important and they need to be accommodated, but it doesn't mean that I am the center of attention all the time. And sometimes I need to wait because other people's needs are more important than mine in that moment. Um and I think that that's given me a lot of, like, a solid grounding in not having too much of an ego. Yes. I mean, I have an ego, right? <laughs> let's, let's get serious. But I think it's, it's, it brings me back a lot. Yeah. So how was school for you then? Did you go, what school, school. did you attend? School was hideous for a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, I, I, so I started off at a special needs school, um, and I was mainstreamed when I was nine, so grade three. Why did you move from the special needs school? Um, it was, <laughs> there was, a uh, this realization from my parents that, um, I wasn't being challenged into, like, academically. Yeah. Um, 
And just because my body is not working the way that it should be, it doesn't mean that my brain is not working. And it was, we found out that the, they do the same curriculum, but it's targeted at learners who have intellectual challenges and learning challenges. And that wasn't my, that wasn't a space that was conducive to my potential. Yes. Um, so we moved. So nine years old, you go yeah. to... So nine years old, I go to a mainstream school and it was interesting. How are you feeling? Can you remember the feeling? I think it was interesting because when you go to a special needs school, I think it was helpful because it, everybody there has some kind of issue. Yeah. Like, you know, it doesn't matter what your disability is, somebody needs help with something. Yes. So I think it's helpful in, like, accepting my disability. I was very, like, still, I'm very much used to being the only disabled person in the room, um, which I think is a bit of a problem, like, just because we need more disabled people in the room. Yeah. But it wasn't like I felt awkward to be the only disabled person there. Um, it was hectic because now there were higher expectations of me that I had to perform at an able-bodied pace. And so that was a good learning Did experience. Did you enjoy the challenges of that? Yeah, I think I, think I was... I was Raised to be, to challenge myself and to not see things as insurmountable. Yes. So I think going there and actually being forced into challenging myself was good. Um, and primary school was cool. Like it was a vibe. And then... Like you weren't ever left to feel like an outsider. No, no. I, I, I don't think so. Uh, high school... High school is a very different place, right? Yeah. Um, high school people get attitudes and like opinions, and um, high school was hard for a lot of the time. Um, and when I got to sorry, like what aspects of high school was it that were difficult? Was it the clickiness of friends? Was I think it... high school is very clicky. Yeah. Um, but it's also I think how my being at that school was framed for the people around me. Um, so it wasn't framed as a very positive thing for other people. It was more like, oh, we have to help Katie now. Okay. Um, and did you feel like that extra package? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I think it was very much, um, I think bullying is sophisticated now. It's not in like... What, in what kind of sense? In that I think that people underestimate it. And people think that it's just like... Oh, Sticks it's, and stones will break Yeah, you know. And like, if people are saying mean things to you, you need to just buck up and like, get a thicker skin. And you have to survive high school. And I don't think that anybody should just... You shouldn't, that shouldn't be the goal. Like, that shouldn't be, surviving high school is not, is not a positive experience. Like, oh, look, my I made it. Like, (laughs) I think for me, so when I, I got to halfway through my grade 11 year, I was like, cool, I'm done. (laughs) What school? Well, that's cool. With, with. With people people and i was like um i refused to go to school for like three weeks was it after something specific or was it just a build up of things it was the beginning of the third term it was the third the day before the the term started i had like such a meltdown that came out of nowhere out of nowhere well not out of nowhere but like because things never really come out of nowhere but um, it wasn't like it built up from a specific thing, and then I was like, ah, I'm out. Yeah. But 
I think it, I had a realization of, like, it was kind of random because it was, um, the, they were planning things for the matric dance or something. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I don't really know if these are the memories that I want to have for my matric dance. And I was like, that was kind of the, the instigator of me being like, I don't really need to be here. Yeah. Like, this is not a good space for me. And I think I've been raised as an activist. So a lot of the time it's, you're struggling so that other people after you don't have to struggle as much as you did and that's been ingrained into me and i'm not i'm not saying that i'm like a martyr or anything but i think it's very much an attitude that that we have is that if it's hard for me i'm making i'm doing advocacy and people are gonna realize through having me in their lives that actually like it's not that hard to do things and be a decent human being but, um, so I refused to go to school, very dramatic, and, uh, I, um, my parents took me seriously after the third week. Third week? Yeah, they were like, okay, she's not joking about this, doing a sit <laughs> Um, and they had to do something because they realized that, like, this girl is not getting an education at this point. Yeah. Um, and so they went and hustled for me. Um, and I got a full bursary to go to uh, Red and Constantia. Oh, awesome. And so I finished my my school career there. Um, Did you enjoy that final year? Yeah, it was a good eight, like a good however many months. I don't know how long <laughs> it is. But, um, but you preferred the sets up there. I think it was important that I had the negative experience because I could go into that space and be like, listen, we tried this. This doesn't work this way. Yeah. We need to do a different way. So you learn from those experiences. But I think it was a different approach that the school took to me. It was a lot more like Katie is one of us. And uh, we support our own, you know. And um, there was an expectation that they would be helpful. Like blatantly, they were, like my my grade and the people around me were told you are not gonna wait for Katie to ask you to help her. You are going to offer help. Um. So from the get-go, that was very different. And I, I, it took me a while to actually trust that intention, yes. that it wasn't like... It's very complicated being a disabled person. <laughs> it's very complicated because we have our own complexes. Yes. And other people have complexes. And we have complexes about other people's complexes. <laughs> because... <laughs> It's insane. Like, <laughs> I've, I've been it's insane. It really is. is. I think being a disabled person, at least for me, is a very complicated experience. Um, but you make like you make fun of it as well. Like, because, like you're saying, like, yeah, yeah like, I can hang around. I don't really have much of a choice. Yeah, like, like, yeah. If there's no car that can fit my wheelchair, I guess I'm now like <laughs> on the freeway. <laughs> part-time employee at Foxconn, like, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, like, the chaos manager. But I think it's it's interesting and complicated because, um, because, like, we have baggage and we have complexes as disabled people and we worry about a lot of things that yeah. able-bodied people don't worry about and... I worry about how, like, what complexes everybody people have about disabled people. And so when you're interacting, that's also on your mind. Like, how 
is what I'm saying being interpreted by you and yeah. how are you you thinking what like it's a lot like it, i don't know if i'm making sense right now no you are because but, like one thing i was wondering for you is like when you're in public and you're in your wheelchair yeah you you're naturally going to have eyes on you yeah and how, how does that feel for you so i i've been <laughs> What makes disability very complicated to address is that everybody has a very different experience and everybody reaches their disability in a different way. So I've been disabled my entire life. So that's my perspective. Like, I don't feel like I've lost anything because I can't walk because I never had the ability to do that. So for me, um, I don't have issues with people looking at me because that's just the way it's always been yeah so and i was taught that when people are looking they're curious it's not that they are like being inherently disrespectful yeah that's a great way to put it um but also there are sometimes when people are just looking at you and you're like you're being a bit of a chop right now <laughs> but for me i like i kind of there are also fun things that you can do like what when people like people don't think that as a disabled person that i so i have a physical disability my I can still see people. Yeah. And disabled people, I think, are quite good at observing. Because a lot of the time we are. Like, we observe life a lot of the time. And um, when you do that, you grow skills. So my peripheral vision is, like, quite, quite solid. Yeah. And so when people are staring at me, I can see it. And it's fun to kind of look at them and see the like. Yeah, Yo, you must be able to read body language. To see quite like well. the whiplash that happens when they're just watching, and then they awkwardly try to find their coffee because now they don't want to to know that they were watching. Mm. And I'm like, bro, just say hi. Just like, chill. I think yeah. it's fine. <laughs> I think it's fine. And there was a day where I was feeling a little bit extra spicy. <laughs> and uh, this woman was watching me like intensely and uh, my friend was feeding me ice cream or something which I get it like it's an experience yeah it's like, fine Mark like, feeds me ice cream <laughs> perfect <laughs> so it's like it's something to witness <laughs> and uh, like she was watching and I turned my head and I looked at her and I was like hi <laughs> how are you how are you doing today? And she could not. Like she didn't know You're what kidding. to. She didn't know what to do, because I think, I think there's a lot of. Um, it's like able shame, <laughs> I guess. But yeah. like you're watching because you feel bad for me, and that shame. She can't even eat an ice cream by herself. But listen, I'm literally only using energy to chew. So I'm saving energy to do other things. <laughs> yeah. And people feel bad that I don't have the ability to do stuff. But I have the ability to do other stuff. And um, so I think all the awkwardness comes from surface level interaction. And people not really engaging. Yes. Um, in meaningful ways and so i see my role as a bit of like bit of a roaming educator you know like if you have questions i'm really cool with you asking them because then you can get like the answers from the horse's mouth instead of making up your own answers and like based on preconceived ideas and whole bunch of stereotypes and all these other things but other disabled people feel that it's none of your business to ask me these things. So it's an interesting kind of situation and context to to exist within. Yeah. Um, How how's it for like I remember reading a a book called 
uh, eight steps forward, seven steps back, or something like that. Yeah. By this, written by this Japanese guy that had severe autism to yeah. the extent where he couldn't actually speak. And I read his daily journal entries. So like each journal entry was like a page, and yeah. it's all the things on his mind. And one of the things I was like deeply moving was how you're saying. As he says, like as you said earlier, disability doesn't aff- just affect the person; it no. affects the people around them. Mm. And he just goes in and goes on saying about how he hates seeing how his his family are treated different by everyone else around him when they have to take care of him or yeah. when he has a throwout. And yeah. he just wished in all of them that he could just voice certain things. Yeah. So lucky enough, like he can with, write, you, yeah, like he can write, yeah. you, you can speak, but you never ever get that sense of geez, like, this is my ability, I'm happy to live with it, but I wish I wish I could just run for a day or just walk normally and people would not see me. Like. So I, I think that there are moments like that, but I think for me, it's not, it's never been like a, like a, why did this happen to me? Why, why do I have this disability? It's more of a curiosity. It's more like a, my life would be way more convenient right now oh, if okay. I was not in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, and it's it's stupid things like when I drop like a pin or the day that my leg spasmed and all of my pins and everything fell down the stairs of the lecture venue. And I was like, hey, <laughs> disabled moment, like winning. But... I I think it's not helpful to 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 dwell dwell yeah <laughs> to dwell on those things because it's not conducive to actually to moving forward. So obviously I have days where I'm like, this is dumb. <laughs> I'm not on board with this body. Like, can you just get? Can you just get on board with the plan? Like, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that everyone has those days, and it's it's naive to say, or, like, obnoxious, to be like, I don't get affected by my disability in the way that other people see me, because yeah. like, I'm a person, and, like, things get to me. I just, I'm, I'm in a very, like, vocal circle so when things get to us we just vent for like five hours about how stupid that is <laughs> and then and then we're okay like then we make plans okay um, <laughs> and my my mom has like all these strategies to to, to so we have a three minute rule three minute rule yeah okay so shit happens <laughs> and uh, it's okay to like freak out about it and yeah. to not be okay with it. But you have three minutes to gather yourself. So you got three minutes to not be okay with it, and then you have to make a plan. Because anything over that is like self indulgent, depending on what the situation is. So do you is. use those three minutes like a professional? Totally. <laughs> so those three minutes are like... You're spinning in circles. <laughs> <laughs> They're very intense minutes. And then after that, you're like, okay, I'm fine. <laughs> now, it doesn't have to be only three minutes. I mean, they can happen like... Like... No, today I have one, and then like four days I'll have another one. Okay. But like, so you don't have three minutes per issue, but three minutes per meltdown. So, <laughs> what's the space before I can do another meltdown? Depends. Okay. Depends if it's meltdownable. Yeah. Okay. Probably, probably <laughs> like this. Well, what's the most amount of three minute meltdowns you've had in a day? In a day. In a day. Worst day. (laughs) (laughs) I I think this is like a bit of a flawed method, but I think... (laughs) 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 Nobody has interrogated me by the three minute rule. Um, I think the most meltdowns in a day was probably like in high school when it was 
like a solid, solid like six. Six. But like very close. Must have been exhausted by the end of the day. Very close together. Okay. (laughs) But I think it's important to actually acknowledge that that you do have to give yourself space to be upset about stuff because. We live in a world that's not made for me, and it's not designed for me, and it's not really considerate of me and my needs and my accommodations. So in that way, it doesn't make sense to be okay with everything, because everything is not okay. Um, Is that what's pushed you so much to become an activator so that... I think so. You doesn't have to come. Oh, the activator! I like that. Yeah, I went for activator instead. I like it. I like that on purpose. (laughs) I like that better than activist. Yeah. Um, Too mainstream. Thanks, (laughs) Christian. Um. So, I think that is why because as when you live in a world that's not made for me, you have to advocate for yourself to get the rights that you. To get your rights, so you're kind of naturally an activist because of the situation that we've been given. Yeah. So, um, if you want stuff, you gotta fight for it. Um, and I think that's just more or less true based on <laughs> what your situation is. Um, so I think it's just. interesting what you were saying earlier about when other people have complexes or insecurities yeah can you like walk me through a bit of that for you because like when i see girls that constantly wear closed shoes because they're insecure about their toes it's like i get it do you know what's going on i get it (laughs) how does that make you feel what like, the, like, the, like the, looking like having like your like having your friends being yeah. like oh, I'm, I'm I'm actually gonna start wearing clothes shoes I'm really insecure about my toes I think um I understand the foot thing because feet are very personal <laughs> <things>. <laughs> <laughs> but like does it does it make but you angry I what that people make such big deals about such little no, things no because I think that I make big deals out of little things. So I I don't think that it's fair just because I've been given a disability that's like apparently this big deal. I don't think it's fair to say that, ah, oh, my issues are bigger than your issues. So you need to just get over yourself because you're being a little bit dramatic. Like, <laughs> because I can be dramatic about like, Tiny things. Do you want to give me an example? I don't know. I'm trying to think of it. I I freaked out the other day. I I think I have OCD tendencies. Okay. So I was working on my notes for for my research. And I was doing reading and stuff. And then I... It's funny, no one else is going to hear this. And then, the, <laughs> like, I was working with a particular pen, and then that pen ran out. Was no way to be found. Oh. So I was like, clearly I can't do my work now because I don't have this pen. And then I started panicking because I'm like, I need to get the work done, but I can't do the work because I need the pen. Yeah. And then I found it this morning, so it's fine. Now I'm doing the work. Where was it? In your sister's room? It was in my room. Okay. My room is quite a scary place. <laughs> <laughs> Not the most organized place you will see. But you know, I think it's I think it's normal to actually freak out about small things and yeah. to be insecure about things. And you know, it's interesting because I I was having this conversation with someone I don't remember, and. I sit with my hands with covered like this, right? And in my jerseys, my ha- my they're always over my wrists. And um, 
who they asked me, like, do you do that because you don't want people to see your hands? And I've never thought about that. And I looked at them and I was like, I'm doing this because it's two degrees. <laughs> like, I'm not embarrassed about what my hands look like. It's this is a purely functional thing. Like it's cold, so my hands are cold. But like, I have circulation problems. So hey, cover the wrists. <laughs> and I think that's where a lot of the misunderstandings come from because. Like, I'm doing something purely for practical purposes, and you can come in and think it's got this huge, like, psychological reasoning behind it. Yeah. And sometimes it's just cold. <laughs> <laughs> so well said. Yeah. Now, tell me about your wheelchair, because that's kind of how you... Can, this is kind of how you got on the map. Yeah. Before we start, how fast does that thing go? Not fast enough. Not. I'm pretty sure there's something you can remove in there that like unlimits the speed. So I, I learned like a couple of years ago that you can take off the delay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a bit of a hazard. I don't, I don't think that that's a good idea considering that I have random body movements and spasms and things. So I think I could enjoy Crash, people yeah. and myself. But, um, I, I have, I have different wheelchairs for different things. Wow. No, but this is, this is why I'm like, no, stop it. Because <laughs> you have different shoes for different events. Like, you don't go to a formal event in a pair of hiking shoes. Like, you don't do that. Yeah. So you have to have wheelchairs. Oh, so they're all different though. Yeah, they fit their purpose. Okay. Yeah, what's, so what's today's one? This is my everyday chair. Okay. This, no. I thought you were going to bring like your formal one to a podcast like this. Sorry, I thought I'm you were going to bring out the shiny one. I'm sorry. I'm, okay, it's okay. I don't have any shiny <laughs> chairs, though. They're all very like work oriented. They're all purpose driven. Okay, cool. But this chair is my everyday chair. This one doesn't have a name for some reason. Do the rest have names? The others have names, but this one I'm just, I think. I think I'm the personality in this chair, mm -hmm. so this one is still to be named. Okay, but I'll think about a couple. Yeah, no. So, and for some reason, all the names are, are men's names. Oh! Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but that's the thing. Who's your favorite man? I mean, we'll <laughs> <laughs> no, so I So, I have this chair, I have a dancing chair that's smaller. I'm better at the turning and yes. stuff. Uh, more maneuverable. Yeah. There it is. Maneuverable. Yeah. That's a really hard word to say. It's not harder than that. Palsy. It's cerebral palsy. I struggle. So I practiced this morning. Yeah. <laughs> See, I am so but I don't have to really speak that clearly. People are just like, okay, she's disabled, like she's trying. Mm -hmm. But my family is like, Katie, speak. Use your words. Yeah. <laughs> Use your words. Um, and then I have um, my I have my running chair. His name is Bruce. Bruce. Sounds yeah. fit. Right? Yeah. Sometimes he's a bit of an ass. Yeah. And then I have my, there's the chair that I climbed Kilimanjaro in. Yes. Um. His name's Scotty. Cool. Let's talk about Kilimanjaro like, and Scotty. Scotty. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Because I also did Kilimanjaro. Yay! And somehow it's come up on... Somehow... <laughs> come on, Mark! What are you doing? I think, I think, I think Mark has done Lion's Head once. Lion's yeah, Head? Yeah, so it's nice. All two times. Lion's Head, head. Lion's head is intense though, guys. Yeah. Like, let's not underestimate. Yeah. But still. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So please tell me about it. How did the idea come across? We were drinking. Okay. <laughs> and we were at a bar and we were drinking and it was... How like, old were you when you climbed it? I turned 21 on the mountain. Come on. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, yeah. back to the drinking. Yeah. So we were drinking at a bar and we were sitting around and we were like, you know, what would be cool? <laughs> We'll be climbing Kilimanjaro, and like we had all these ideas of like 
the Great Wall of China and like Machu Picchu. I'm so keen to do Machu Picchu, but like now I read somewhere that they've made it accessible, which is really cool. But now I'm less and like now I'm what less mean, accessible. Keen. Yeah, but I thought Machu Picchu like always with been ramps and stuff. Oh, lovely. Which is very cool. Like, good job, Peru. Yeah. But also now, I'm, for some reason, I'm less keen to go do it. Okay. I don't know. I think it's like when things are easier, I'm like, I don't know. Okay. I like the challenge of it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then it took us, like, after that bar, it took us, like, four years to actually get to a point where we were climbing the mountain yeah what uh do you know do you remember what route you did did you do wrong route? i don't know we did it we did a combination route okay yeah to be easier for you because we took an extra day to acclimatize oh awesome um so we did five days up and two days down cool um and people are like you climbed the mountain in five days i'm like yes <laughs> yeah we did that <laughs> Um, and it was... So how did it work? So you've got your wheelchair and you've got the yeah. team around you that yeah, takes so turns. Yeah, so I have, I, like, in my official team was, like, eight people. And, uh, like, my my people were eight people. And then my... So each climber or whatever gets assigned a certain number of... Porters, I guess. Yes. Guy, it's like two guides per person or something. And um, so I had six. Okay. Um, and Lucky. Uh, <laughs> it was the most insane thing I've ever done in my whole life. So. And um, yeah, so we had six, or there were six like allocated to helping me up. And then my team would help me with everything else. Because it's quite hectic to climb that mountain, so we wanted our whole team to make it. So it made sense to just have them help me, like not overly exert themselves, so that we could all get to the top together. And did you have like a lot of people leading up to it, saying you shouldn't do this? This isn't My possible. My sister. <sighs> My sister. No, I love her. She's wonderful. But um, she's like. She was very concerned about the whole situation. Did you say you've got um, three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I did tell her to get over herself. Though. <laughs> um, and I, she was stressed out about it from like, right up until like the third day of us doing the climb. She was at work and she told them, like, listen, my sister's not me a mountain. Do not expect me to do any work today. And um, then we sent down the stats, like the body stats or whatever, like the oxygenation and, uh, like, I don't know what the others are. But my stats were solid and they were, like, <laughs> like second in the team or whatever cool. and then my sister was like okay she's fine okay cool. and she's not gonna die on the mountain she'll well, be okay i'll tell me about summit day because that's the time the... day i did not believe people when they say these things we should believe people <laughs> like we should listen because they say summer day is gonna be the longest and hardest day of your life and i'm like oh, please yeah I'll be fine. Like, I remember yeah. someone said to me, "It's like if you can do ten star jumps at the top, I'll give you five grand." Nobody can do that. No one can. No, no. Yeah. And if you can, screw you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's insane. I was it really cold for you? It was the most freezing I've ever been. I think when we got to the top, it was like minus fifteen degrees or something. Yeah. It was insane. I had like nine layers of clothing on and I was still frozen. <laughs> I think I think the mind is such a powerful thing. This is where I, I think what I learned on that mountain is the power of your mind. Because there were so many times on that mountain where I was like, this is a problem, but we don't have time for this to be a problem right now. 
So it's not a problem. <laughs> Everything's fine. And, like... I like that. Okay, we're going to get quite personal now. Let's Are you it. ready? Yeah. So Buckle I, up, Mark. <laughs> Buckle up, Mark. So, um, I had a catheter for the whole, um, the whole climb because I was like, there's no way that seven people are going to help me in a bathroom every two hours. Yeah. So I had the catheter and the, the pee bag was tied to my leg and I was winning because I didn't have to get up at night. People were like super jealous about it because they went to the bathroom like five times. Yeah. And I get six hours of sleep. <laughs> I was like, sucks for you guys. Yeah. Disability perks. Yeah, now he's disabled. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going up the up summer day and I for some reason had just decided that the pee was frozen. Because I was frozen. So I was like, you know what? <laughs> yeah. We can't do anything about a frozen bag of pee. So let's just not think about that. I will deal with it later. <laughs> and the thing is, <laughs> it was not frozen, in case you were wondering. <laughs> but I, th- I worried about that for like five hours. And then, <laughs> and then I started worrying about other things because I got, oh, did you take this? Yes. And uh, they don't tell you about... When, oh, when, I'm, when about did you get altitude sickness? On summer day? Or yeah. on your climatization? No, day. on some of the day. Okay. It was, we were, I think we were at like, um, uh, we were at M- Mona's point. Oh, uh, yeah. that. And oh. that's the point where you get there and they're like, whatever's going on, we're not taking it down because we're too close now. Yes. <laughs> so we got to there and I was like, woo! We made it! Yeah. <laughs> they always tell you that it takes another like two hours to get to the peak. Yes. I was like, you guys are like, just look in the distance and you can see it. You're like, like lying to the, your people. <laughs> and we get there and I was like, I had ear issues before we um, left for summit. And we left at like 11 p.m. or something. Yeah. So I was thinking, you know, it's a good idea to take a Mopedal. <laughs> guys, <laughs> guys, Mopedal plus minus degree weather plus like altitude is not a stellar combination. What happens? No, I Did was. Did you see pink so... elephants? No, opera. Opera? Opera. <laughs> Up in the caves, guys. No. Insane. Insane. But I was in the. It was a great time. You're rocking that way up. Yeah. Like, yes. <laughs> and I, like, before we went to go climb, I was like, cool. My power song is totally Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> I was like, how is that not a power ballad, right? So I'm like, yes, this is going to be the song in my brain while we go up to the top of this mountain. Do you think I could remember any of the words to Bohemian Rhapsody? No. No. I had, literally, I had Rihanna (laughs) and Taylor Swift (laughs) in my brain for like seven hours. It was insane. And we got to like an hour from summit and I was like I don't feel good <laughs> but this whole time I'm like wanting to pass out because I think from the Mipedal yeah <laughs> which makes sense because that's kind of what it does but <laughs> I was debating whether anybody would notice if I took a nap okay I don't know if I took a nap I don't remember. I don't think I did. <laughs> but um, I remember being on top and being so internally excited, but not being able to like Show express how excited I am. Yeah. 
I couldn't even cry. I was like so tired. <laughs> and it was minus 15 or something when we got to the top. And um, I, I left my eyelashes on the mountain as they froze. So I got at least <laughs> eyelashes. They grow back quickly. So I did not have eyelashes for like a while. Did you? They're, they're, like a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Mostly, mostly like the, the outside ones, like the yeah. edges. Yeah, I didn't have eyelashes, guys, for like a good like week. It was ridiculous. Felt like a naked mole rat. <laughs> <laughs> but now, how, how was the way down for you? Was that fun? Awful. Worse than the way up. Awful. Because now... <laughs> Imagine yeah. he like dropped you and like you just started going. Oh, no. I, <laughs> on our way up, we, we only told my parents about this like six months after we got back. Because we were like, I didn't die. So we don't really need to share every detail that happened. Yeah. And then Taylor, my friend who climbed with me, we were at a bar and he was like, ah. Yeah, I was a little boy, you skid down the mountain. And I was like, Taylor, we were not telling people about this. <laughs> <laughs> There's screen and stuff, and when you step it, like, you slide down, yeah. which is really demoralizing, but, like, that's what you're there for, right? <laughs> to overcome. And uh, one of the guides, he was standing, like, at my shoulder, holding the wheelchair, and everybody was attached to the wheelchair in some way mm. to, in case I slipped, so that they had me. Yes, and it's quite steep at this point. Yeah. We did not think about the possibility of one of them slipping. And so he slipped, and he, like, went down... Like 40 meters down, and yeah. he's attached to me. So I'm going down as well. The guy at the front was like a friggin'. He had to be like a. Anchor. Yeah. Superman. I tried to think of like an animal, but like, <laughs> it's not happening. But just tell me what he does, and then like, we can think about like, an animal. He had to like fully brace, and he's like holding on to like a rock or something so that the rest of us don't fall to our deaths. But <laughs> luckily, most of the people caught their footing and like got it. And uh, he came back and he looked at me and he said, Ham nashida, which means no worries. <laughs> and I was like, are you joking? Are you joking? That's not no worries, my friend. I that was worries. That was worries. <laughs> <laughs> so that happened. So that was quite hectic, and then that was still like six hours from the Come top. On. And when we got to the top of the mountain, we had realized that I hadn't peed in like nine hours, mm. <laughs> which. It's not, it's less than ideal, right? So I was feeling sick because I, we, I think that that was a contributing factor. Yeah. But we sorted that out, but then I still felt sick. So I was like, clearly it's altitude sickness now. And um, apparently there are different manifestations of altitude sickness. Like some people get sick. Yeah. Other people hallucinate and do all these things. Mine was the great paranoia. Okay. So good, guys. So good that the person in the wheelchair that's relying on seven people to get her up and down the mountain who has no control over anything that's happening, that's the person that gets paranoid. The paranoia. <laughs> and it was real. <laughs> I've never. Like. I fully, fully believed what was in my mind, yeah. what was happening. And we got stuck in a fog storm. Maybe not like a storm, but it was proper foggy. Like, if you were where you are, we couldn't see you. How are we going down a mountain? I'm like, this is so great. 
<laughs> so great. I was fully convinced that it was taking seven years to get me down the mountain. And I was so convinced that it, because it was taking so long, I was convinced that they were taking me to Kenya. <laughs> And they were going to leave me with, like, a tribe or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which is insane. It only yeah. took, like, four hours or something to get yeah. down the mountain. But still, I, I think that's where your brain is, like, your mind is such a powerful thing. And it can go either way. Like, yeah. it can help you to achieve stuff and to overcome stuff. But it can also be, like, such a barrier. To actually, and the, the guys just go with it. They're like, yeah, they used what to. are we going to do when we get to Kenya? And I, I remember saying something stupid like, well, when we get there, we're going to have to find the school. It's <laughs> <That's> important. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Like, what is happening? Now, how, sorry, change the subject. Yeah. I've got to ask you, how was the comrades for you? Because this year... Oh, uh, we are. Well, 2016, you you guys. I first. might cry. <laughs> Is it? No, I'm okay. I, you didn't, you didn't I, hallucinate I, or no, paranoia no. on this one? I, um, so many things happen at Hamas. Which like, one? Ooh. Well, all of them. They each have their oh, own. Oh, yes. Okay. Their own, like, little bookends. But I, um, <clears throat> so I went this year. This was going to be my fourth um medal and we missed the the halfway cut off by 90 seconds can we have a moment of silence do you need a beer i did then and we were like okay. they were like what do you need and we were like alcohol <laughs> um I can appreciate the equality in it that they weren't like oh shame that the disabled people go through yes but it's did, you, did you try to play that card? They did, and it didn't work. Oh, and okay. I was like, ah, it's okay, you're making it worse, it's okay. So now, how, how did you manage to convince comrades to let you do it in the first place? Lawyers. Really, <laughs> eh? Yeah. So, uh, we, typical to who we are, we entered and then we read the rules. Right? Yeah. Who reads the rules before you enter? Who things? reads these and sees? Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> and my my partner was like for the first one. He was like, "Guys, we're not actually allowed." <laughs> and we were like, "Oh, okay, cool." So we engaged with them, and they said no, and we were like, "But yes," and then they said no, and we said, "But yes." And then they said no, and we got lawyers to say, but yes. <laughs> um, so we um, we're very lucky in our country that our constitution is amazing, mm. and so it literally says you are not allowed to discriminate based on the disability. So we were like, um, hi. It should have been a very short little yeah. lawsuit. So, but you know, advocacy is a journey and it, and, and it takes yeah. a while for people to to fully recognize a lot of things. So we're four years in now and the first year was very much like, oh, what's happening? Like even the people on the road were like excited but still confused. Yes. Like, how is there a wheelchair here? And now people are so on board and like the comrades are so on board and they Have you seen other people, other guys in the So it's, um, it's, <laughs> it's always been the two of us, myself and Anita. And then, um, 2017 we had Jean, who's a self-propelled athlete from Philadelphia. She finished. We had to advocate for her as well. Um, but she was in it and she did it in like 10 hours, something which is ridiculous. And then last year, there was a guy named Grant who, um, he did it in a wheelchair as well because he has, um, MS. Okay. So there are more people. I think they were very stressed that we were going to come do the comrades en masse 
and, and create a logistical nightmare for them, but it takes a long time to grow a sport and to get people with disabilities into it. And combat is hard. Like, you're not going to get, like, Friday night runners who are like, oh, you know what we should do? We should do the combat. So, Which was your favorite one? My favorite one? Yes. Ah, uh, that's hard here. Because I think they're all special in their own ways. I don't think I'm going to get through a combat and not be an emotional mess. Um, the first one was a huge deal because we were the first people that yes. were allowed and actually <laughs> finished the race. Yeah. We've since discovered that there was a man who did it in 1976 or something who um, was a wheelchair athlete and he did the full race and then they, he wasn't allowed into the stadium to no finish. So we're still trying to find him. There you are. Hey! Is that Bruce? That's Bruce. Crocky. Yes. Ah. Uh, Oh, Look how good it looks. He's an athlete. Stella. Um, and the runner is Stuart. <laughs> oh. uh, it would so, be cool if he was also Bruce. Right? <laughs> Funny story, though. So we were training for combats this year, and we were going downhill. And So um, when he goes downhill, does he jump on top of you? And he goes... No. You know, so many people ask us <laughs> that, and they say it like, oh, you should get a step. And we're like, you know what? You should get some <laughs> last. <laughs> um, no. But um, <clears throat> there's so many things that people say to us that we're like, thank you so much for your insight. But I could hit you in the face. <laughs> Like, when there's certain things that I'm just like, maybe you should not say this. Like, it's really interesting because combat is a good representation of this in that people don't think that disabled people are working as hard as their able-bodied partners in the, yeah. in the, the running particularly. And so at the beginning of the combat, people say to my partners, they say, Good luck. And to me, they say, enjoy. Yeah. Which is not cool, guys. But then we get to, like, 55 Ks, and I'm still in the chair, and, like, struggling, and they're, like... What's struggling for you when you're in the chair and you're um, going? I... So my body works hard when we run because I have to brace the whole time. So there's a lot of balancing, there's a lot of bracing. My back is always a problem. My knee is always a problem. See, runners have knee problems, guys. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> FYI. Um, so like, I get cramps and all of these things too. So people just don't realize that my body is also doing things. I'm just not moving my legs. They're still working. Yeah. Um, also, it's just, it's a really long day, <laughs> and uh, sometimes I'm just hungry. I know. That's a big struggle, trying to decide what I'm going to eat that's not going to, like, bore my body, yeah. because 12 hours is a long time. Like, you do combat and you don't want to see a potato for, like, eight months, because wow. you're like, I've had so many potatoes today. Get away do you run? From me. Do, you, do you eat potatoes along the run? Mm. Is that a thing? Yeah. Ah. Potatoes. I know it looks like I've run the comrades. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's um people eat people eat their own things like peanut butter sandwiches are a big deal. This year I had my peanut butter sandwich and we're going up and I was like, Ugh, I literally can't deal with crusts right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so you keep yourself occupied with like eating as well because okay. it's just it's so far and you have to distract your brain from what's going on. Um, I think it's my foot. I think one of the most emotional moments I've had in the combats 
was in our first one. And um, <coughs> it's insane what this race does to people because you have, like, strong men who are just, like, broken down into emotional wrecks. And um, not that it's not okay for men to be emotional. Yeah, but Mark. Breaking down, <laughs> breaking down <laughs> patriarchal stereotypes. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it's a huge thing. And we um, got to, like, the, we caught up to the 11 hour bus, which we hadn't seen in, like, 11 hours. <laughs> and um, I think we were, like, 12 Ks from the end or something. And um, my partner was like, how are we going to get through this bus? Because they were impossible. They were across the whole road. And it's just... They take up a lot of space. Yes. <laughs> um, and so Britt was, got vocal and he was like, wheelchair runners coming through. And the guys in the back of the bus um, saw us and then we moved and it was like the parting of the seas <laughs> which was amazing that that even happened in the first place yeah. and we went through and while we were going through they started applauding us oh. and I was a mess I was done <laughs> it was over I was like I can't so I'm crying <laughs> we get through the bus um, um, Hudson says to me, Mycroft, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I'm and he's like, I asked him how he was doing, and he was also crying. And I was just like, cool. It's all good now. Like, I'm not the only emotional one in this team. But I think it does things to you, because you're going yeah. through something that with 19,000 other people. And just to have that kind of recognition in that moment in our first one where we had to fight so hard yes. to get in it was, like, insane. And we got to the end and I felt like we felt like gladiators. It was so good. Because you get there and people are like, oh, and the crowd is crazy. And you're just like, yes, yeah, we did that. And the middle is like the size of a like two man coin, and you don't even care. <laughs> you just like give it to me, thank you, thank you, bye. Have a good day. I'll see you next year. I think it's insane. I think everybody should do a comrades at least once in their life. I'll, I'll, Let's I'll, go, I'll, I'll guys. I'll probably end up doing it over a drunk bit. That's what Let's we'll go. We're thinking about doing like a KB bus. Okay, can I be on it? Yeah. <laughs> Come join our bus. We'll do, like, we don't guarantee a time. Wait, now, now but... how's, the, how's this whole Kaylee campaign come about? I'd love to hear a bit of a story. Would you like to have some more of your coffee? Because I feel like I <laughs> haven't given you a chance to take it. It's all sip. good. I take a while with... with... Okay, cool. Take Thank your time. You. I'll pat this. See? Okay, cool. Um... I know, I'm also getting good. What do you do when it's like right at the bottom and it's like the same size? You get a like... new beer. Ew. Was that a challenge? No, like you pass it to your able-bodied friend to take the last sip and then you get a new one. <laughs> That's how that works. <laughs> yeah, I'll have another one. And there it is, the Katie campaign. Thank yeah. Can I watch you do? To all those able-bodied people. Don't put it in fast. You put it in slow. Okay, I'm going to show them what happens. Oh, we're talking fast. about the straw, so put it in guys. fast. Then it, then it does things, and then you have to do like a down, down, and be dramatic. Yeah, then you end up being a shortcuter. Which is a waste. Maybe not a waste, but like. Yeah, I'm surprised can, after like a whole year of drinking in Stellenbosch, I never noticed that. You can also like aspirate, it's a problem. Hmm? <laughs> when you inhale things into your lungs. Uh, <laughs> Disabled knowledge, thank you, welcome. So that's what. <laughs> <laughs> so the Kaylee campaign. Yes. Moving swiftly away from the alcohol discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Excuse me. Uh, we got a dog here. Yeah, by the this way. is Aiden, my service dog, being very. Um, yeah, that wasn't my tummy. <laughs> very cooperative. Um, I think hey. she's so a friend. I like she's so much. Yeah. Um, candy campaign. Yes. Okay, so we started 15 years ago. Uh, um, to raise money for a motorized chair for myself. Yes. Um, and we raised the money in seven weeks. How'd you raise the money? Um, we sold cards and little DIY sunflower pot mm-hmm. things. We called them sunshine pots. Okay. <laughs> so good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Like twelve year old branding. Um And your you and your friends just go door to door knocking or to be at yeah, school. Yeah, so we started with like around the neighborhood and then we got our school involved because we were like, listen, this is gonna take our whole lives. Yeah. To get it if we're going around the neighborhood. Um and we got our school involved and they were like, Cool and um then it kind of exploded in a way that we were not prepared for. Um, was there something specific that made it explode? Like yeah. a, like an interview somewhere? We, or? No, so we um, we were planning to like sell at the market day. And then um, we realized that actually what we should do is um, sell them at the market day but get pre-orders because pre-orders are the way to make money, right? Um, so we were going to order them with the school before and just deliver them or people yeah. could collect them at the market day and so we did the orders and we got like a thousand orders in like from one day. school yeah and we were like oh okay okay cool <laughs> and now we had like we had to make like 1500 sometime pots or something ridiculous <laughs> We did not think that through. Like they're very, they're very. People are too supportive. Yeah. <laughs> like thank you for the support, but it was insane. We yeah. just it exploded out of like goodness, and that was cool. Yeah. That people were just so excited to get involved, and they were supporting the cause, and not like. So we raised the money in seven weeks. Um, I got my chair. How was that, getting in the chair? That was cool. I liked it. I think I've always been, like, a bit of a wild child, I guess. And so I'd believe that, yeah. <laughs> so I liked it. And when people ask me what I liked the most about it, they said that, or well, I said that it sounds kind of stupid, but I said that I can run away from my sister. She's not aggressive or anything, guys. Like, yeah. it, it's that, like, it's the ability to choose where you go and not be put where other people think you want to be. Yes. And if I want to leave a room in a huff, I can. <laughs> and be dramatic and I can't yeah. slam doors, but, like, I can leave with a whisk. Yes. Like, <laughs> so, I think... It, People need to not underestimate the the power of that that independence that you can choose where to go, um, and that was like the biggest deal with so, the wheelchair. So now you've got your wheelchair, you're loving it, and it's like why stop? Why stop here? <laughs> well, somebody donated a chair that was not my size or anything, and we were like. I kind of do something with this now. Yeah. So we found someone for that chair, and then somebody, like, people wanted more cards and stuff. So we were like, okay, well, people want to do good. They just need to have a channel for this. So we were like, that's nice. We can be your channel. <laughs> um, and we formalized it, and it's grown a lot. Like, it's evolved very organically, I think, into what it is today because it started off as a assistive devices mission yeah and providing stuff and now 
we're a lot more about advocacy and awareness, but I think it's important to have all of those things um, to really create a society that accepts all of us for all of our abilities. And when when were you aware that you had made that list of the most influential South Africans? That was great. Like I just got my friend tagged me in it. She was like, "Good job," and I was like, "Ah, <laughs> oh thanks!" Like it wasn't like you didn't apply or anything. Like it was just people like. I mean, that's how, that's how I came across you. Yeah, I it was very cool. I'm very excited that I'm on that list. I think. I think it's about what you do outside of those things to get you onto those lists. Yes. It's not necessarily just about being on a list. You have to actually, you have to live by what you, what you sell, I guess. And what what was this, that award that you had to go overseas for? It was a Children's Peace Prize. Is that the be- best way to yeah. describe it? You'll know the word for word. Where it was. Come on, Mark, help me out, Jeff. Um, so I won the... I won the... <laughs> Give me a sec. <laughs> <laughs> Google, you guys. Um, they told Didn't you know, she have that International Children's Peace Prize yeah. and hog? <laughs> hog, then hog. Um, yeah, so we went to uh, the Netherlands to receive that award, and it was amazing. It's been such a, such a platform for me to kind of to spread my message and to raise awareness about disability on like such a like a global scale. So Did I you think, have to speak in front of Yeah. Others. It was quite the intense experience. I <laughs> so I <laughs> love Katie Tidbit. I can't speak when I'm crying. Okay. So, <laughs> Generally, that's fine because I have myself together when I have to speak to people. Yeah. But um, <laughs> that day I did not have myself together. I um, there were a lot of photographers and, and um video guys that were around me. I nearly rode over one. I felt really bad. <laughs> and um, yeah, rode over him trying to get your peace prize. Guys. <laughs> Yes! Hey, give me my prize. <laughs> yeah. Can I leave now? No, but um, it was it was very stressful. I I was strategic in that I the stuff that I had to say that was emotional for me I put in the beginning. Okay. So I could be like, oh, yeah. I got it and no, say rip it, that and off. then I can be more activisty. But um. I was on my way to go onto stage and there was a ramp and there was a banner like in front of the the ramp and for I don't know what happened but I got stuck on on the ramp. You got stuck on the ramp. Behind the banner. <sighs> so yeah. So you just disappeared. I'm like, guys <laughs> somebody needs to help this to table go out. You should have like hooter on your There thing. is one, but it's kind of stupid. Like it doesn't so that's the on, but then like. No man, you need like a taxi. I mean, to... I mean. Yeah, you're not the real South African taxi. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what is this? <laughs> I, that's not. That's just like an annoying noise. It's like low noise. battery. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so I did not do that. If I did not think about like that as an option, I just kind of looked at the presenter guy and I was like. Oh. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> and uh, so he helped me up onto the stage and um, pushed me. And uh, I, <laughs> I'm going and now I'm crying because there were kids in the audience that I didn't know about. And they were like, whoa. And it's like this super serious environment. And then it's just these kids who are like super excited. <laughs> I wasn't ready. It caught yeah. me off guard. So now I'm crying. I'm stuck behind a banner. Like my family's there. My sister and my mom are crying. Everyone's crying. Now I have to give a speech. And I was like, how am I going to speak to these people? Because I literally 
I can't speak. And I think if you look at the beginning of my speech, you hear me. I'm doing this kind of. Yeah, trying to hold them back. <laughs> you shouldn't hold back the tears. You should let them run like Mark. They are hard to do anything, guys. They are hard to function. It was hectic. And then I gathered myself and um, I gave my speech. And I was super proud that I didn't actually well done. Like, die in that moment. And then I was like, cool, all the emotional stuff is done now. And then they had a woman singing our national anthem. And it was insane because it was like she was singing it to me. And I was like, it's over it's now. A- like, I'm crying. And my mom came on stage and she was crying. But then she said to me, um, <laughs> she leant over. She like wiped my face. And then she said, I need to stand up now. Because I need to sing the anthem. And I was like, cool. <laughs> I back this patriotism. So she's standing and I'm crying. I, like, it was amazing. I think, I think it's super important to be emotional. Yes. And to show that you are an emotional person. I think South Africans are very emotional people. Like, regardless of where you are, on like on opinions yes like we express our opinions emotionally and like i think that's such a phenomenal thing that we have as a as a country and like we're very robust people like if we have an opinion like you're yeah gonna know there's about two sides it. of us yeah like i think <laughs> like traveling around the world and seeing how other people are it's very interesting to to um to recognize how different people are yeah and how similar we are at the same time it's like when you there are words that only we understand and like like hectic hectic i didn't even know i like like when you messaged me earlier you were like see you now now and people don't know what that <laughs> means and we have debates all the time about what the difference is for now and now now and just now yeah. because there's no, my friend um he's from Argentina yes and he was he asked me but what do you say for now now like now yeah and I was like we don't have anything that's there's no word that means yeah, we don't do it straight now. Because yeah. now is <laughs> not even now is now. <laughs> now means just now. Yeah, it just happened. Yeah. <laughs> he just looked at me like, "What is happening? I don't understand you people." But I think that's also that you yeah, that we just confuse people, and that's yeah. okay. Um, we can't. We're starting to run out of time here, but I just got two final questions for you. Uh, one is people listening to this podcast now. Yeah. How, how can they go about contributing to the Katie campaign? Now it's your pitch. Yes. Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. Um, no. So we, you can become a pledge partner, which we really like. We like pledge partners. Um, and we can find this all at katiecampaign.coza. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can if you're an active human being. <laughs> um, you can be a cyclist for us you awesome. can be a runner you can join our running club I'd love to do that um, yes yeah. come run with me cool. um, and there are so many ways like, we are very open to people bringing their skills yes. and, um, and their enthusiasm <laughs> <laughs> um, and so if you want to do something with us, connect with us and cool. we can we can make things happen. And then the last question for me is for everyone out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how to put it, more towards the, let's say, able-bodied people. Like you say in one of your videos that you, one thing you just want is for disabled people to just be treated 
on that same level and you yeah. mentioned earlier how it's also got to do with a lack of time spent with those people mm. if there's like any message you could put out to everyone right now <clears throat> what would that be i think my message would be to not be afraid to embarrass yourself about how ignorant you are <laughs> <laughs> i think i think there's this uh, weird situation where people think that people living in situations are not ignorant yes and i think that that's bullshit i think you can be disabled and still be mm. ignorant and so there are we just need to chat to each other a lot yes. more and to be open about things and to be willing to be wrong as well because i think so many of the issues that we experience as a society is because people don't talk to each other so just talk to each other just talk to each other and like be open about the reality of your existence like it's it's hard to be a disabled person like yeah it's hard out here. Like, come join my club because I like the company. And, like, come have these ridiculous experiences with me. Um, but at the same time, I think disabled people need to be open to having those experiences and those conversations. Because yes. for me, if we're not sharing our knowledge that we've gained through living our lives as we do, we're doing a disservice to other disabled people because there are so many lessons that people have learned that can be helpful. Mm. Where, like, maybe I'm learning that lesson, but I don't need to do all of the admin around it. Like, you, yeah. you could share. Yeah. <laughs> share your little, like, nuggets of wisdom. Uh, because people want to know about it. People want to hear what we have to say. And people want to be empathetic and understanding and inclusive, I think, most of the time. I agree. And so if we, as disabled people, are not open to that, then what are we... How are we supposed to expect people to respect us and to, to want to include us, include yeah. us if we are not open to it open to including ourselves awesome thank you so much yeah. Kaylee it's thank been such you. a treat thank you yeah Mark, can we wrap this boy up awesome yeah. awesome thank you I want to give you a hug yes <laughs> hugs are the best uh, you barely drank it in your coffee I know but I'll have it now oh,